right, in this lecture, we're going to look at German expressionism and two facets. Um, one is called De Brücke, which means the bridge, and the other De Blau Reiter, which means the blue writer. We're going to see what, what sort of collectively um, we can say about the German expressionists and then uh, give some examples of both of these two groups. Um, so as we said in the last lecture, the sort of negative sentiment of the 19th century or the 1800s is gone and that the dawn of the 20th century, there's a little more positive and there's a lot more interest in the human experience through objectivity and science and progress. Um, this can be evinced by what we've seen with the Fauves. They were very sort of ex exuberant, this idea um, in experimentation. Um, and at this time, people are searching for how to define themselves. And so it tends to be... Um, in some ways, a very secular period, um, looking outside of the church, not needing the church to dictate morals. Um, people are sort of reeling for a new identity. Some are nationalistic, so they're looking to their roots. Some are religious. Some are exploring other cultures. They're all looking for a way to identify themselves and to express themselves. So enter into this time in history, the expressionist. Now, expressionism is a general term. And that is art with an emphasis on emotional content. The subject matter and the formal elements have an emotional content. And we've seen examples of this in the past. Um, think about um, Delacroix, Death of Sardanopolis, or The Scream by Monk. Um, these German expressionists, specifically, this sort of capital G, capital E, German expressionists, um, in the movement in the first few decades of the 20th century in Northern Europe. And their roots are a few. One, romanticism. We've gone back to romanticism because they too were very emotional, very subjective, and very personal. Um, they look back to the phobes. Um, I think you could probably see that looking at these two examples on the screen. Color as expression, and we know they got that from the phobes. They had other interests though, flattening space, an energetic handling of the medium and the brush. Um, and they also looked at political and contemporary issues. The first group of German expressionists we're going to study is called De Brücke, or The Bridge. They were under the leadership of Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, and they saw themselves as the bridge, hence the name, between the old and the new, quote, linking all of the revolutionary and fermenting elements. Their members are artists like Kirchner, Emil Nold, um, and others. And at the crux of their movement, was a distaste of academic art and popular impressionism. They were against industrialization. Well, that's not new, and materialism. Again, they wanted to break with the past, and we've seen this as an avant-garde notion. Um, but also, we have to remember as well, these are sort of tense times in Europe as we're moving pretty quickly now that we've stepped into the 1900s towards World War II. <clears throat> so, we think about these artists living at this time against industrialization and materialism and the tense times working towards World War I. Um, we're not really looking for a common likeness um, so much as what they're sort of working against, sort of the old way and academic art. These artists were fans of Van Gogh, the French Phobes, of Monk, um, of African art as well. Um, they tended to have a sort of hard angularity. They liked jagged forms and structures. They were influenced by the phobes, as I said, but out are sort of family members and cityscapes. Remember in our last lecture, we saw um, sort of the open window and um, we saw the woman in the hat. That sort of thing is out for these German expressionists of De Brucke. Um, and what's in is showing the harsher side of life, sort of unsettling scenes, prostitutes, even eroticized depictions of children. Um, a decadence sort of gone too far, it's sort of tension over harmony. And I think you can see that in the two images that we have here. The one on the left-hand side is by uh, Kirchner. It's called Street at Dresden, 1907 to 1908. So what do we know about De Brucke that can be applied to this work? Well, first is our subject matter, of course, contemporary life, non-academic sort of painting. That means non-classical, sort of a Renaissance-style painting, of course. Very dark kind of almost dreamlike, has a great feeling of being confined, tilted space sort of going straight up, gives it a very claustrophobic feel, very harsh, and sort of confrontational. We can certainly see a sort of um, negative sort of view of some of the contemporary living. Um, all of this is offset by, of course, our style choice with that complementary color. Um, all those colors are a little bit hard to even look at. 
So we can certainly see that there. And, and also with the work on the right-hand side, this is Emile Nold's Crucifixion. It's from a Life of Christ triptych. The year is 1912 here. This is how religion was translated by Dubrucka and the German expressionist, sort of harsh and ugly, again, jarring color, these exaggerated features, but again, very emotional and very unsettling, with uh, very sort of claustrophobic space. And there's really no way to escape because the space is so flattened and claustrophobic. And because the scene sort of fills all of the space there, um, it really does give us an expressionistic view of the crucifixion, very emotionally charged. And we know, again, that this is specific uh, specific to Dubrucka and the German expressionists. But there's another German expressionist movement that would look very different um, from what we saw with the Dubrucka or the bridge. And that's called the Blue Rider or Du Blau Rider. And I'm going to pull those images up here on the left and right hand side. This movement was perhaps more sort of far-reaching and influential than Dubrucka. It was centered around an artist named Vasily Kandinsky. Again, no exact style for the Blue Rider, but considered expressionism. And here's why. The sort of free use of form and color and space. The, Dubla, the, the Blue Rider was also skeptical, skeptical about industrial society. Uh, but retreated from the world rather than taking it on in an openly sort of critiquing manner. So with our last images from Dubrucka, we saw the sort of jarring in your face, claustrophobic sort of image of the way they saw industrialization and materialization in the sort of modern world. But the Blue Rider sort of took a different view. They sort of gave us things um, that, that sort of showed that they were moving themselves out of, of society. Um, so retreating rather than taking on the world sort of openly. Vasily Kandinsky started out as a lawyer, but soon caught up, uh, got caught up in Munich's art scene. And he was interested in non-objective works, painting without a literal subject matter from the natural world. So he believed that art should be concerned with the expression of the spiritual rather than the material. So that's important, this idea of, of sort of having a spiritual rendering rather than one that is rooted in the material. So he had a pursuit of spiritual transcendence. And so the inner creative force for him was a product of the spirit rather than a learned skill. So rather than being sort of focused on the sort of classical painting and learned skill, really what you were going for is that spiritual content. And this idea of being non-representative, of not being rooted in the natural world is really an outgrowth of this belief. For Vasily Kandinsky, the subject matter was then seen as a hindrance. And so he really is the first artist to break through to a new level of abstraction. He broke the representational barrier. So in previous artists, we've seen color not having to be representational. But with Kandinsky, we see the whole painting doesn't have to be representational. It's a hindrance. You're always sort of looking to the outside world previously and replicating it. Well, if it's a renaissance, you replicate it pretty um, uh, pretty well. I mean, you, you are really sort of wanting to get a window onto another world. And, and slowly over time, we've sort of seen ourselves sort of divorcing ourselves from this notion. But Kandinsky really makes that final break in this idea that you really don't have to represent the natural world in, in any form and that you're really going for that spiritual uh, representation. The image on the left hand side is the sketch for composition two from 1908. It's named after music. Um, so he named, oftentimes his works are named composition or improvisation or impression. Um, he starts out, as we can see, and the reason I chose this image is that early on, he starts out still representational. It looks almost like a Fauve-like work. Um, it shows an interest here in the sort of the biblical flood and Genesis, um, the apocalypse from the book of, of Revelation, this sort of deluge and this great wave. Um, so you can see it's highly abstracted, but still rooted in representation. But it still shows the artist's emotional and intuitive response to the world. If we fast forward three or four years to the image here on the right hand side, we can see again that Kandinsky um, rid himself of needing to represent the natural world. This is composition seven, um, total abstraction. It's a study of color, form, line. It's very explosive. It is again a pure representation of the artist's inner spirit without the hindrance of representation. So the overall effect 
um, for Kandinsky and for the Blue Rider was freedom, spontaneity in an image that was very much unpremeditated.